So, what's the subject for today? Uh, we are talking about our brains and creativity and automation, and, and can we still be creative um, with the next phase of, of automation, I guess. Mm -hmm. There's, there's many ways to, to approach this thing, I hope. I hope that we get a good start. You know, it's like... There, there's a lot of fear related to artificial intelligence and mm -hmm. autonomy and entities. Um, the basic question you get is, will the machine replace us? Will the machine kill us? I think it makes sense to start with understanding why is a human being different, at least than all the other species we're looking at in the world today. And the main reason is because we're tool makers. We make tools. Right. When we confront a situation that our anatomy, physiology cannot deal with, we're able to build tools that give us a solution. Mm. So for now, let's say men has been machine makers, you make a car that can run faster than any animal and run faster than you, mm. and you solve that. You can make a plane and you can fly like a bird. But all those technologies so far had needed an operator, a human operator. So that's why they've been tools. Yeah. So the trend that we're observing right now in the world is that we're starting to create tools that run themselves by themselves, that become autonomous. Not only do I, can I create a plane and fly, but I can create a plane that can fly itself. That doesn't need me to fly it, which is the autopilot. Not only can I build a car, but I can have a self-driving car. That the car make decision on its own without the operator. That trend in autonomy, we're calling it artificial intelligence, which I think is a word that I don't really like. Um, because when I say artificial intelligence, if I have intelligence, why would I want it artificial? That's the first thing. And, and second of all, what is intelligence? So if intelligence is the capacity to give the right answer when I have a problem in front of me, many human beings are not intelligent, but they still have a brain. So I think the, the word I would look for is more, we're building artificial brains rather than artificial intelligence. Right. Those artificial brains or even a human being who has a brain may or may not give an intelligent answer to a situation but it's still a brain. And uh, so the concept of will those machines replace us because they make decisions on their own or will those machines help us be better? I think we have to make a conscious decision by design that we have to design machines that help us become better. Yes, it has to be something we look at like complementary medicine. They were designed to be complementary medicines, I think. We need to rephrase the conversation and look at um, you know, artificial intelligence, artificial brain as being complementary to our brain as opposed to something that we fear that is going to to, to kill us or to, to take over our lives or, or wipe us out. Um, and I think that's where the fear comes from. And I think it's, a, it's an unnecessary way to view the situation. One of the biggest fear that we have is that what if a machine decides that it will, the best way to survive is to take off all human beings? So that's what we see in the movie. Well, you know, we, we've all had you know, the dinosaurs and the you know, Ice Age and the Eskimos and the you know, Paleolithic era and, you know, th there has been different eras and we don't know how our particular epoch is going to end on Earth and it could be my machines, it could be my natural. We just, we just don't know. And there's no point, I think, putting a whole bunch of stock into this 
orchestrating of the unknown mm. and being afraid of it instead of just sort of embracing what we can do with it. Well, you see, when you I can end up down a rabbit hole. Yes, yes, but 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 I think there are certain things we need to be worried about. Okay. For example, let's 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 talk about them. For example, right now, if I could build a machine that is pretty smart at figuring out to always feed you what you want, okay, and make you addicted to it, that would be a very good business model. Sure. Right? Because I could observe your behavior, really figure out what is it that you cannot say no to. I feel like that already exists with advertising and with on-demand apps and I don't, that, that already exists. Exactly. But I'm saying we already have machine figuring mm -hmm. us out sure. and outsmarting us into feeding in our behaviors and our fears and we're not even aware of it. Yeah. And that machine is not sleeping. So, you know, when you look at most dictators, what is the ability of most dictators? Is to understand how to tailor a speech, a story based on my fears mm -hmm. or based on my most deep desires mm -hmm. and push me through that. Right. Now, imagine I have a machine that can tailor that speech for each one of us. Right. The conclusion is I cannot get off social media. Because I'm having a machine doing exactly that to me right now. Who is tailoring a story of the world, of my world, that keeps feeding me that view and that next thing I want to see or confirm. Mm -hmm. Because it knows me better than myself. It knows my weakness. It knows my instinct. It understands my story. This is not even about privacy. Privacy is 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 a, is a low layer of this thing. It's not um, about privacy. You know what I mean? It's dead. <laughs> it's about am I living with a predator without even knowing I'm a prey? I think we all know that we are prey to a lot of these things. It's just how much capacity or willingness really that you have to to override it. I think people are very aware of it. Generally speaking, it's just I don't know if people have the tools or even the will to to you know seek out something that might be different. I think people just tend to go with go with the flow of it um, rather than you know throw their arms up against it. You know, I'm, I'm going to be even deeper about that. I don't even think it has to do with will because what I have is a machine that whatever I do to avoid it, learn my new pattern. And again, feed me what will make me stay. Mm. I think we may say we don't have the tools, but the will, I cannot beat this thing. You know, I'll tell you something. So one of the most beautiful game that the human brain has invented is called Go. It's a very simple game game. Mm -hmm. But at a strategic level, it's the highest strategic game that ever existed. So we always say that computers, machines, or artificial intelligence or artificial brain will never be able to beat the best Go player. Okay, It's already being done. It's called AlphaGo. But what's interesting is to understand how that machine was trained, and then you'll understand what all those algorithms are really doing. So AlphaGo, when we talk about teaching a machine, machine learning, we're trying to replicate the way the brain works. So the brain makes connection. If I see an image of a baby, I call that baby. I see a thousand images of different babies. Mm -hmm. when, you say, when you show me a thousand and one, most likely, I'll realize it's a baby. Because my brain made those connections. What is it that I'm connecting clearly? It's not really clear, but I do make that connection. So that machine was fed with all the games that human beings were supposed to play or have played, or they could feed that machine. And they taught that machine how to become a Go player. So that's the first phase of it, which is called the neural network that was created. But then there's something more interesting that happened. 
which is called reinforcement learning. So you say to the machine, play against yourself a million, a trillion, a gazillion times. Imagine all the scenarios and build more data that don't even exist because no human being have ever thought of those moves in a lifetime. With that new data that no human brain has never thought of, you train the machine again. Mm -hmm. So in reality, when you're sitting in front of that alpha goal, what's happening is you have a machine who understands the limit of what human beings have been able to think so far, and that machine has thought beyond generation of human beings in the future that even have never had those thoughts, and it's playing against you. Mm -hmm. So the best goal player was playing games, first game he lost. Okay, you might say it's a surprise. But what happened in the second game is that the machine made a move that all the best Go players in the world were saying it doesn't make sense. Right. But when you were looking at the calculation that machine was doing, it says it's one in 10,000 times the probability that another human being would have thought of that. That means one in 10,000 times the probability that that human being I have in front of me would understand what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So he was playing, not only playing the game, but playing against the capacity of the other human to understand what to do. Right. And when you get to the final of the game, everybody understood why it was so beautiful. Mm -hmm. Because no one would have thought of it. So what we're talking today is when I'm on any platform that is using any type of algorithm or rule or equation, however you want to call it, that the job of this machine is to figure me out, I'm at a disadvantage. Even if I have the will to do it, I change behavior, it adapts my behavior because it makes mo way more calculation than me. Now, there's a second part of that story. This incredible goal player keep playing, kept playing, in one of the games, he made a move that no human being would have made before. Mm -hmm. Was also one in 10,000 time probability that a human being would have thought of that. Right. So what is the miracle? What is the magic there? The magic was all that training that the machine did by this Go player interacting with the machine, he was able to absorb it as well. He was able as a human being to become a better version of him being a human being because he learned from the machine right. as well. So here is where you have that famous expression of two face of the same coin. I can be the machine playing against me, figuring me out. Or we, the human race, can start using those machines to transform ourselves at a better version and solve our problems that we couldn't have figured out in millions of years. But we still need to interact with those machines. I wouldn't say let them decide by themselves. Right, they, need, they learn from human interaction. I mean, you could also look at it from the point of view of how you define artificial intelligence. And it's really, since the beginning of time, there's been, it's existed, maybe not in the way we see it now in machines, but I mean, if you look back decades ago, it was when you had very limited, uh, say, media, you sort of relied on radio and, mm -hmm. and maybe a free-to-air, where governments or whoever it was could control the messaging. Um, so essentially, to some degree, it's, it's yeah, for lack of a better word, it's, it's a brainwashing. But it's always existed. It's just existed in different forms. And if you look back, I mean, some of the earliest CIA programs, you know, to... to, to beat the Soviets was experimenting with psychedelics and, and anytime anyone went 
road, the propaganda on it was, oh, they were brainwashed by this, the, you know, the other side, whatever that might be. And so I, I kind of think the same questions that we have with artificial intelligence and this sort of machine learning or whatever now aren't all that different to arguments that we've had in the past, just in a different way of who is manipulating the message and how. And the sort of the doom and gloom, I think, that surrounds it now, well, we're still here, <laughs> you know. We had the same doom and gloom centuries ago. We have been having the same doom and gloom conversation for a really long time. And I think we adapt. And we will, I think we adapted in the past and we will continue to adapt. Yeah. And it's not without hiccups and it's not without things that will go wrong and things that will go right. Um, I just think when we look at it from an alarmist point of view, it, that, that's not benefiting us. Mm. I think the more that we can look at these things as being a step in the evolution of the human brain and the evolution of the human being and what we're capable of, um, the better. And, and I think that adaptation process requires a certain degree of uh, awareness, obviously, and training, and, and, and employers need to train their workplaces for what will be the jobs of the future and what won't be the jobs of the future and how are we going to adapt to the changes. And I think the earlier and the more that we can start doing that from school age, um, you know, and in the workplace, the less fear that there is surrounding. And I think when we, a mistake we often make is if, when we're scared of something, we don't try to prepare for it or, or make the plans for it. And I think that's a mistake that we make collectively in society is creating this kind of scare tactic around it instead of embracing it and, and planning for it. So the question is how how do we plan for it? How do we appropriately plan for it? And where should resources be dedicated to it? And I think you can often look at the military as an example of that. Because they they you know they have this endless budget that they can prepare for pretty much any scenario that comes their way. And they can you know, spend gazillions of dollars creating aircraft and uh, bombers and all sorts of technology that will never be used. Hmm. Um, but they have the, I guess, forward thinking approach of, of being able to prepare for these unconventional scenarios. And I think that there's a lot we can look at now to kind of follow that model, if that makes sense. Yes, it makes totally sense. It's like, I, I took a stand. My stand is our only way out is through creating better artificial brains. Yes, because we're not going to get rid of the artificial brain. No. That cat is out of the bag. Exactly. That will continue to develop. So it is. It's about embracing that development. This, and, is, and this is my stand. This is actually why I do my work. This is what my research is based on, is using automation and algorithm to make better decisions. Mm. But the thing is, those tools by themselves, with the wrong intent in the design, actually destroy human being faster than we think. For example, we're always thinking that scenario of doom and gloom. Okay, right now we're running into a anxiety or depression epidemics in modern society. Everybody I know is on something. You know, everybody I know. And we're still asking, why is that happening? And I can tell you why is that happening. <laughs> right. It's because you have on your phone a machine that is job is to make you dependent. That is not good for the brain. Sure. But that also shows you how powerful that machine can be when you design it with the right purpose. Mm -hmm. Because what that machine understands is my weakness. So if you understand my weakness, if you're a parent, why don't you help me get out of it instead of feeding it to me? Right. Which is the right question to ask. Right. You know, if human being has a propensity to be violent, okay, why don't you build a machine that helped me correct that path in my brain that makes me aggressive and violent and see the bigger picture? Yeah. Where I don't need to be violent because I can solve a bigger problem and not fight for the next piece of meat. You said validated? Violence. Violence. You know? It's like, 
human being, because of the caveman in our DNA, we solve conflict with aggression. Mm -hmm. Might be, for example, the planet is going in a way that is not beneficial to us. Mm -hmm. So why don't I <laughs> canalize my aggression towards solving this? Now, I may not have the will or the capacity to do that, but if a machine knows my weakness and I interact with a machine designed to help me a better human being, that machine can actually help me make better decisions. Yeah. Not falling prey to my instincts just because I need to click on the next ad. Right. Because what is that, what that is creating is more separation in society and it's a society that is more and more you know, subject to consuming chemical to rebalance that chemical imbalance that those machines are creating in your brain. Mm. So what are we doing? Mm. But you can use that same tool, which is incredible, to actually move faster to solving our problems. Absolutely. That's how I've used them in making decisions in the stock market. And that's right. how I think we need to expand the way we design to actually use them to solve other problem we will have to confront because the real enemy for a human being is cosmic entropy. What do I mean by that? We're on a planet and just by the passing of time, things get more complex and we're not learning fast enough to solve those complexities. We need design of those machines to help us keep winning that war. Yeah. To keep being sustainable on this planet. And to keep being a combination of, you know, whenever I talk to my friends, they say, oh, but you think that human being is a cyborg. Yeah, human being is already a cyborg. Because when I say, hey, I'm going, I call a friend and say, I'll see you tomorrow morning in Buenos Aires. I know I'm going to do it. Mm -hmm. But how can you do it? Yeah, because I'm going to take a plane and I'll be there by 7 a.m. in the morning. I am literally in my thinking, assuming I can fly. Because I can, because I'll take a plane. So I'm already, when I'm behaving in the world, I'm behaving beyond my physical capacity because I've built so many things around me to be bigger than what I got from nature because nature helps me build tools. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Human beings' capacity is about building tools to make you better. So we're already cyborgs. So what's happening with autonomous technology is that we've solved how to run faster. We've solved how to be stronger physically. Now we have the opportunity to solve how to think better. Right. But usually the way society is designed today, the guy who thinks better use this capacity to prey over other person, over other human beings. So we have the first tendency to say, oh, why don't I build a machine that help me do that? <laughs> When you say build a machine, what type of machine are you necessarily referring to? A phone or what are you referring to? So let's define what, it, what, what when I say machine, I'm, I'm thinking of an algorithm. So what is an algorithm? An algorithm is a set of rules that you follow. Mm -hmm. For example, you took the example of propaganda machine. Right. Okay. So let's say your job is to figure out what is the message that the public will assume as beneficial to them. Okay? Right. So your job is to create propaganda. That's right. your job. Right. Now, you need to use psychology, behavioral, behavioral and cognitive science to design those set of rules. Now, the way it was done before, it was a bunch of people sitting in a room and trying to figure out how, how do we do that. You have your hypothesis, you try designing the campaign and all of that. Right. Today, it's much more easier because what happened is you have your behavior on social media, so I can tag you faster, easier, knowing what type of story you can listen to, what type of story you like. Right. And I build a machine that learns from that without my intervention being the designer. Mm -hmm. But it's the same set of rules of any PR person. But what yeah. happens is a machine doing it, and the machine learn by itself. Yeah. So the machine will learn scenarios that in 24 hours, a human being would not thought of yeah. because it will test them all and yeah. then come with a better solution and keep evolving. I mean, and that's the way that so much of, you know, when I was at apartment hunting toward the end of last year, I, um, I, I have, um, 
I was using an app. I don't even remember what it was called. Somehow it was referred to me. And then the uh, guy was, the guy was not a real person, but you know, he was an artificial guy. But he, um, you know, <laughs> I, I challenged him. Yeah. But no, it was cool though. I felt like I was talking to a real person. It was in Facebook Messenger and I would send him, you know, my budget and what I was looking for. And he would, you know, send me a whole bunch of suggestions every day on apartments that were coming up that were within the parameters of what I wanted. And, you know, anytime it was something that, you know, was, was a bit off the mark and I would, you know, not be interested or whatever. And yeah, the machine really learned from it. It was really great because I was just getting this daily flood of possible apartment selections in my um, sort of, yeah, that met my criteria. And I just thought it was great, but yet I could actually message the person. So mm-hmm. it wasn't like using a street easy or something where you just yes. kind of put in the search parameters. It was, I could actually message this, this bot mm-hmm. and, and get a personalized response back, even yes. though it wasn't a human, but yes. it really felt like it. And it, it did make that process of, you know, hunting online actually Enjoyable. And enjoyable. enjoyable. And I knew I was talking to a bot, but the yes. bot just responded to me well, like exactly. a human would. Exactly. And I, I kind of just loved it because, yeah, I didn't feel that sense of invasion of, of having just necessarily talking to a person, but I also, the bot, you know, it was super responsive. It wasn't yeah. like you were waiting for someone on the other end to get back to you. And it made it an, an interesting process, I guess. Yes. And, and, and that's. That's exactly the part that you can we can use with it, you know, which is helping us design better product to create more value to people. Yeah. Because that's that's what you're saying. You know, it, it took away the, the hurt the the whole issue of going to that very difficult process in New York of finding an apartment. Yeah. You know? But the bot, the more you interacted, knew you and could have helped you even yeah. make better decisions. Yeah. But imagine that my job from a design point of view is just to sell you the one I can sell to you, which is not probably the best for you. Right. That when it becomes tricky. Right. You know, because I can use that same enjoyable back and forth to then give you anything good for you or mm-hmm. not that good for you sure. because it's better for me. And I have asymmetric information against you designing that bot. That means right. I know more about you than you know about my intention. Sure. And this is where it gets tricky. And this is where I think it's also the enormous potential. You know, the enormous potential is from a design point of view. What is your intent when designing this machine to have an enjoyable conversion, conversation with Holly? Is it to sell Holly something bad and make her feeling that it's good because you trust that bot talking to you every day in a language that you could understand, mm. you build that trust like you would build with any human being. And then at the end, the close is I sell you something you shouldn't buy. Or was my intention really helping you understand you should avoid something that's bad for you? Is the bot helping you make better decision? Or is the bot tricking you into making a decision that's better for the one who designed it? I think that's circumstantial, but ultimately there's everything is a two-way street and you know their job is to act like a you know a broker and my job is to find an apartment so you can help each other achieve those goals yes it's just like a human relationship other than that's automated and much faster and much less of a laborious process than that we might be used to in dealing with a human and and there's a benefit to both sides and i think that's a lot of the intention of most apps and things is there's usually a very specific purpose of somebody looking for something and that person looking to sell. And, you know, it's, that, it's a two-way street, like any transaction in life is. Yes, like any transaction in life is. But we learn to survive in life by reading in another human being, when is he lying to me? When is he tricking me into making a bad decision? Mm-hmm. You know, when you go out to, for, for a broker, you're actually broker shopping first, which is, which is the broker I trust. Right. You know, which is the broker that will actually give me what is good for me. And right. then that's the broker I follow up with. Right. But we've learned how to read another human being or how to develop that trust or right. that mistrust. Okay. 
That same process, when I'm dealing with an algorithm, the algorithm has an advantage over me mm -hmm. because the algorithm knows what I will be looking for and will pick the words in a way to make my trust level higher faster. But then comes the next decision. Once I have that trust, is that bot trustworthy? Because that was a design decision from the one who designed it. Let's hope that it is. Right. Because if it is, you actually build an incredible tool sure. to make our life better. But if it isn't, you actually build a scalable <laughs> bad broker sure. that no one would figure out fast enough. Right. And that's where the danger is. So we always think that the machine will destroy us, will be some Terminator coming. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's not because we're already suffering from that. It is those bots figuring us out and making us behave that in a way collectively we become less happy. Right. Because we, the bots keep making us making the wrong decision for us, but making it look like it's the best decision for us. Sure. Because, you know, it's like... Any, any salesperson, no, that's what, that's what we're going to get. And this is the next evolution go. of that. Here you go. Here you go. But, you know, it, what I'm saying is with a human being, we've learned how to figure a little bit, you know, not to fall into traps. Right. But... The same way I'm looking at that side, that's why I'm so optimistic about us getting out of all the trouble we're in. Mm. Because if those bots, if by design, because the moment is when I do an, ex when I explicit something, I build an equation, I have to make explicit what is it that I think is going to happen. So I'm really designing where is human beings weakness? Why would they fall in those traps? Mm -hmm. you know, that's what you do in behavioral finance, designing model, whatever it is. You know, you understand the bias of the brain and then you say, okay, what is the trap that the brain will fall into? Right. Now, let's take the next step. Since I am in that situation, those machines should help me avoid them. Mm -hmm. And by using those machines in that sense, we actually will find a faster way out of all the trouble we're in, literally. Right. But it has to be a purposeful design. Right. Because if it is not a purposeful design, all you will have is a bunch of machine looking for local maximum. What is a local maximum? Holly is looking for an apartment. I have a bunch of inventory, which is the first apartment I can sell to you, even if it's the worst decision for you. And that bot will win. Because it will take the time to build the trust and then trust you into making a bad decision like any bad broker would do. Right. But the difference is this is more specific to you because the machine will study you exactly when and how and what's the word, what's the point where you most likely will say yes. And then imagine you do that at a large scale, keep feeding people things that are not the best decision for them using that algorithm, but the best decision for the person who built that algorithm. And you don't even know that you're in that big disadvantage because you're still thinking it's like a human being. I mean, you're a war reporter, so you can detect bullshit. You can, you can, you can. I can detect bullshit from a person and a bot, but no, it's perfect. You know, we all, we all run into traps, but that's just sort of life. I, yeah. And, and honestly, I think uh, one of the biggest advantages of, I mean, what's the one commodity that we can't get back in, in life? And that's time. Time. And if we can, make our lives more efficient. I mean, that's just key to me. That is yes. key. Efficiency, time management. Yes. Um, being able to, you know, that's that's time you can use with your family. That's time you can use with, you know, doing things that you love and, and sports and whatever it is that, that you enjoy. And so, you know, looking at it from that point of view of, of time and the time that we can save, that we couldn't save before with automation, that we can invest in things that are important to us. I mean, that's really invaluable. Yes. Um, that's my bet. That's what yeah. I hope for. Yeah. I mean, that exists now. I mean, look at how much you know, we might waste a lot of time on the internet and things, but you know, <laughs> if you, if you really harness that and take advantage of you know the automation that there is, I mean, banking and, um, you know, whether it's you know, online dating or you're looking for an apartment or, you know, it's just, you know, it's endless what you can do on yes. buying music, buying books, buying everything you need. I mean, how much time is that giving you back that you would never have gotten back 
20 years ago yeah. that you can choose what you want to do with that. And that is so precious. Yes, but we seem, but with all those things catching our attention, we seem to have not enough energy to deal with things. You know, because that is the other, the other, that is the other side of the design as well. Because if I keep designing, I keep going back and forth because my main message is those machines, like anything else, they're neutral. And it is the intent that will define if they help us or kill us. Mm -hmm. It is the intent that will define if they look at us as predators and we are prey, or if they help us stop looking at each other as predator and prey. Right. You know, because as long as we continue with that logic of predator and prey, which is what we're thought of since we're little children, mm -hmm. that um, it's like Hobbes said, said that, that men is a wolf for men. You know, it's like, uh, we've learned that in our sociology. It's like, the biggest, the biggest enemy of men is another man. <laughs> right. Because no other species on the planet can trick you into doing things that you want, you don't, you don't want to, you know. We make those decisions. Exactly. We because don't want to take responsibility for it. So the thing is, we think as a, not a human being, as a mean to an end, to our own pleasure, to our own desire. How do I use at a, one by one or at a scale, how do I influence people into doing what I want? Mm -hmm. Because that's how we look at each other. Mm -hmm. So there is a tendency to build machines to help me do that better. That means build machines, build algorithms that help me prey faster on the other human being. That can be a danger if we don't stop it. Sure. Because that's, that's the role of ethics and that's the, Here we go. That's an area that, that is talked about a lot, but there is, it's, it's blurry, but I mean, it, it is in discussions, but it's, you know, that's, that's going to be a, the next evolution of law or the next evolution you know, a lot of things is on here now, really, not the, even the next, but to, yeah, to, to, to know boundaries with that. And I think that there are people that are definitely, you know, working to, to draw that up. And I think it's a little unclear now, but I would hope that in the not too distant future that there's a little bit more of a consensus on what is appropriate and what isn't. But yeah. they, th those those are defining things. You know yeah. what I mean? Those are defining things because what's going on is I have machines, algorithms, however you want to call it. Like just call it machine because it makes me think of Terminator and makes it more fun. Right. But in reality, I'm, I'm talking about work, about design, about instruments, sure. things that can help us. No, but the most of the money spent today yeah. to build those things is to prey on the weakness of other human beings. That's what's going on. You know, it's to sell you the thing you don't need faster. Again, that's been going on since the beginning of time. All you're saying yes. is adding to faster. To there you go. That's what I'm saying because I need, I had to, to, I had to deal with another human being. Mm. And it was always the smarter, the faster, preying on the slower, the weaker. Mm. What's going on right now with those machines, we're all weak. <laughs> you understand what's going on? It's, Sure, I know exactly what you mean. So then that comes to the argument of, well, I mean, you, and this is a trait that, that people, a lot of people would argue that we've lost a lot in humanity or what we teach our children is just discipline, basic discipline mm -hmm. that we have lost a lot of. And, and that used to be something that was ingrained in childhood or, or things that were considered to be, um, you know, important. Taking responsibility for yourself and, and having a certain sense of discipline. And I think you know, it's a whole other argument that, that gets made a lot is we've sort of lost the tendency to teach people what that is and the meaning of that. Um, and that comes down to the instantaneous world we live in, which is great in some respects, but, you know, it can also be, dangerous in others so you know what I'm feeling mm -hmm. now I understand I am pointing from a point that I have in my head a bunch of assumptions that I'm not making explicit to you right and the main one is I think human beings has less control on their decision than they think or they're lazy well what you call laziness mm -hmm. actually for me 
is not something you solve with saying, I'm willing my way out of it. Mm. You understand? I think we have an image of a human being who is all powerful and have choice, when in reality we do not. Well, we lack impulse control. Exactly. So, because the emphasis that used to be on things like that, I don't know that there is anymore. But what happened is most of that training of saying, I control myself. Why do I need to control myself? Because I have some things I call weakness, because I am prone to doing things I shouldn't be doing, things that are detrimental to my future, things that are unintelligent that my brain chemically is telling me to do, mm -hmm. you know? So what we're saying is what you're calling discipline, I think we're saying we've been thought to be careful of our brain. Some people, not every impulse is a good impulse for you. Sure. Because you need to realize that you have an, a, a mammal, you're like a mammal yeah. brain, and you will maximize things that look great but that are not that great. Right. So what I'm saying is those impulses with education in certain people, in certain families, what you've done is push the threshold where stimulus will make you fall. Okay. So what, what I'm seeing, you understand what I'm going? So sure. what I'm calling discipline, what I'm calling education is, you know what? If you ask me, suppose I'm not eating sugar. So if sugar is not good for your sugar, that's not the point. But let's take it as an example. Yes. So if I have discipline, I've learned, if my friends say, hey, you want a cake? I say no. That's one. So if I'm more disciplined, the second time you want a cake, I'll say no. But what I didn't, what I wasn't trained for, is if they take me into a place where it's all chocolate around me, yeah. how much more can I resist? Okay? How much more can I resist? So what we're calling discipline is just how far is your boundary to fall prey to your instincts or to whatever your impulse tells you to do. Right. So what's going on right now is if I can spend enough time with you to understand where that boundary you're out of control, I have an advantage over you. Mm. Because I understand exactly where your education or your discipline will not stop you. Where I'm, I'm getting to that tipping point. Sure. Where everything you've learned is not enough to protect you from what I'm going to tell you to do next. Okay? This has been the way we behave in society. It's, it, it's that, what we call education, training, I have an edge, I have an advantage, is us figuring out how to make people fall into different psychological traps, mm -hmm. which we call influence, which we call propaganda, which we call whatever we want it. It's your benefits, it's whatever you want to call it. But because it's another human being, I have other characteristics I can look at to not fall prey. Those who solve that have an advantage over those who don't. Okay? Mm -hmm. That has been the game all the time. So, Right now, if I can build a machine, I say, let me build a machine that help me play that little game better. Because it helps me find the tipping point of everyone else I want to sell a product faster. Sure. That point where you will not be able to say no. Okay? But what's going on right now is that if we continue thinking like that, we will collapse. <laughs> Yeah. Because there is no amount of chemical energy in my brain to keep fighting against a machine that doesn't rest and will figure out all my evasive move not to fall into that trap because it'll find the way it keep asking me again another question then give me what I want to consume. Call it an idea that I want to consume. Call it a house that I want to buy. Call it whatever you want, but it is not in my benefit, but in the benefit of who designed that machine. Why is this dangerous? Like you said, this has been the game forever. Classic consumerism at a faster, more Exactly. Pace. So what was going on right now is the chemical imbalance in my brain because there is no education that can protect me against that anymore. Mm. Because the machine what is figuring out, like that AlphaGo did, is figuring out a loophole away from the limit 
that my discipline has protected me. He's finding the failure in my discipline. He's finding the failure in my education. Right. It's finding the failure in my barriers to actually incentivize me to do something that is detrimental. Right. Okay. But I like to look at the other side of it. Mm -hmm. Because that can also be beauty. Because if you understand so clearly the weakness of human being, so you can actually help us out of it. Because you say, this is your tipping point where you're about to make that decision which is bad for you and that one which is good for you. Why don't you take a pause and make that decision tomorrow? Yeah. That's what you call a good friend. Right. That's what you call a smarter friend. <laughs> It just, it starts with an awareness and then, and then you have to have, you know, you have to have the willingness to be aware of it and to take charge of yourself. Again, it, it comes down to this, I always go back to it, but we have this idea of wanting to blame all these things for our personal decisions. And we've been taught that somehow that's acceptable to blame everything and everyone else for the decisions we make. When it perfectly comes down to personal responsibility. I mean, I can flick through my Instagram and mm -hmm. there's a thousand ads for really cool shit that I would love. Do you think I click on any of it? Never. <laughs> Never. You know, do you think I, I, I just, yeah, I, again, it's, I don't know. Each person is wired differently, but you can wire, you can unwire and as quickly as you can wire. Yes. You have the, um, the desire to do that, but if you're constantly a victim yes. to yourself, yes. um, then you know you'll you'll fall trap into that trap time and time again. Yes, and and it won't be a, a force for good. It, you, it can only be a force for good if, if you know if you maintain control of that and you're in the driver's seat of that and you look at the advantages of what it can bring as opposed to. Um, yeah, always sort of falling, being the prey. The advantage has to be from a design point of view. Sure. That, but as really a human point saying. of view, we need to be responsible for ourselves too, you know? Yeah, but you, you know, Holly, we will again, and I like that because we're, yeah. we're, 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 we're getting at that limit as... And I completely know where you're coming from, yeah. but you know, I guess I'm just very, very firm about. Oh yeah, because that's what I like about human you. Human responsibility. Yes, you, 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 you know and you that. Don't you don't trust other people to have your best intentions all the time. Like you are the only person who can make the best decisions for you, and and that requires personal responsibility. But what's great about that is that it's empowering too. That no one else out there can make you do something you don't want to do. They can taunt you. They can dangle the carrot. They can do all these things. At the end of the day, if you know nobody else can make you do something you don't want to do, if I hand you a gun and tell you to pull the trigger, I can't make you pull the trigger. Mm -hmm. I can only try to manipulate you to do that. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, you're the one who's going to pull, pull it or you're not. Yes. I think it's tremendously empowering just to remember that no matter, you are in the driver's seat of this. And that there are going to be these temptations around you all the time. And if you take anything away from this, it's just that, that you are the one who can control however clever or manipulative those temptations are, you are still in the driver's seat. Yes. You know, and, and, and that's interesting because you always look at things that I control, mm -hmm. I make decisions. I, I assume, which is which is uh, which is very good. I am a, I am different in that sense mm -hmm. because having spent so much time designing right decision algorithms, I can tell you that we are more biased than we want to assume. The human brain is actually our real weakness, mm -hmm. you know, because you can. If you're not careful enough, you can live a life thinking you're in control where you were never. Because you can, you can ex especially being really smart is a problem with that. I've, I've seen it in my life making, making, making mistakes and, and things like that is I can be making the worst decision, but I'm smart enough to make it sound logical. Right. Okay. And I say, oh, I'm in control. 
But what happened is my worldview, the way I looked at the problem, I took out everything that would question my point of view. Why? Because I made the decision before thinking and I used thinking to justify my move. And then I say I'm in control. Because I can explain it. Sure. But the reality is, when you spend so much time designing algorithms to make you make better decisions, it's because you know your weakness. You know the weakness of the brain. And I know it's a question of how big is the stimulus for me to flip. Mm. You understand? It's like you can probably say no to a cake. Right. In normal circumstances. Right. But if you just lost someone, you're sad. I need to make less effort for you to get that cake. What changed? The cake didn't change. It's the same cake and you know you shouldn't eat it. But what happened is a certain s level of circumstance will change the chemical barrier of your brain at that moment. And that's your vulnerable moment. And right. that's my moment of entry. And mm. those where you will make that wrong decision. Mm. And that the machine, because I designed it as an equation, systematically will look for them to make a bet, to make a trade, or to make any other decision of selling you something. Right. That doesn't make men weak or unweak or strong or non strong. It's understanding how the machine in me works. My brain works like that. It's chemical reaction based on certain external stimulus and based on certain internal message. And I call that thinking and decision. Mm -hmm. But when you understand it, you understand the limits of the instrument I'm dealing with. I understand the limit of my physical body. That's why I build planes and cars to run faster. I understand the limits of my brain. That's why I build decision algorithm to help me be faster in the way I confront problems. Mm. Now, if I don't understand that and I'm dealing with all those machine algorithms on my phone, on my Instagram, whatever you want, platform you want to call it, it's literally crazy because I'm fighting a war I cannot win from the get-go. Right. From the get-go. Because even if I'm strong enough, it will wait for that moment I listen to a sad song. So the machine will say, oh, now you're sad. So let me show you <laughs> that mm -hmm. drink you need to take right now. Mm -hmm. That in other normal circumstances, you wouldn't take it. But I would never offer it to you in those circumstances because you're not that vulnerable. I will sure. calculate your moment of highest vulnerability. Like you said, is that be, it has been done forever. That, that is the story of, of the world. Yes. You know, human being making those bets against other human being. Law matter loophole law. Man is a wolf for man. We prey on other men. But at some point, we need to realize that's dangerous mm -hmm. because it's becoming dangerous right now because we're building machine to prey on each other. Mm -hmm. And that can be natural because we're already suffering from it, which is so much fighting against so much temptation all day. You have that chemical imbalance in my brain that I need to be taking another medical chemical to help me balance that. Everybody's suffering from anxiety. You say, right. why is it I'm suffering from anxiety? Because you're fighting a war every day against okay. those stimulants. Yeah. And we think we can control it until to a certain point because I won't win a hundred days but if you have two years using social media, at one day you will be sad, but one day you will feel different and that that's my moment of, of truth, that the moment of vulnerability and I will make you make that decision that will change your life for the worst or for the best. Right. So what I'm saying is, it is important to understand the enormous potential of those capacity that we have right now to design tools to make our brain become better. Mm. But that has to be purposeful. Right. It cannot, you, you know, it's like we've become, we've, be, we've advanced so much that we need a different understanding of our responsibility. Mm -hmm. The damage we used to do before, we could be stupid. And that damage would have never touched the tipping point of no return of our life on earth. Now we've become so powerful. We're 8 billion people. We've built those incredible machines that can learn faster than human beings, that can take scenarios that no human being in any lifetime or any society will understand. We got to that point. We need to be less cavemen because if we keep being more cavemen with a bigger stick, we're going to wipe out everything. 
Right. We are doing it. It's not the machine doing it. It's because we designed those things to be a worse version of ourselves because we're still looking at other human beings as prey and predator. Right. You know, and it's so innocent as doing click on an ad, but that's not the point. The point is you're weaponizing those algorithms against the brain of people that don't have enough chemical energy to fight back. And that's the anxiety and depression epidemics we're living. Right. That's what's happening, and that's the reality. You may want to call it like that or not, but that is, it's a mathematical thing. It's well, a I think, I think that's, they're multi, you know, that's a multi, you know, that's a really multifaceted um, argument to make, I think. Mm-hmm. I think definitely the you know, social media and other things play into that, but again, it's very circumstantial. It's, yes. You know, each person has the circumstance for that, but I also think, um, you know, if you look at even the flip side of that, though, I mean, social media, or, you know, it, it also provides an avenue for people to reach out to other people yes. and to get help they need. And I, you know, I do see ads to things like, you know, again, it, it might be cheesy, but I know of friends that have used it and said it's been tremendously helpful is, is there's an app called Calm. Mm-hmm. Where, you know, you take 30 seconds out. Yes. Uh, there are apps for white noise for when you sleep. Yes. You know, there are, there are things that, that are a great advantage to, some, you know, to counteract yes. some of the effects exactly. of anxiety in the world. Exactly. Um, and a way for people to reach out to one another. And I mean, you know, when it's, you know, it's, it's your birthday on Facebook and suddenly you just have hundreds of people writing you all or sending you exactly. a message. I mean, people that you hadn't spoken to for 10 years, your yes. aunties and your, um, you know, your neighbors from when you were five. Isn't, you know, that, that to me, I think that's a great uh, unifier as yes. well that that can provide. So it's not, uh, it's not always closing us out. In other ways, it's, it's bringing us in too. Yes. Um, so I think that automation, you know, and apps and that kind of thing from that point of view, you know, has a tremendously beneficial effect um, on a human level yes. as well. And, and you can feel, you know, it's, again, it's a double-edged sort of, of feeling isolated because you're not you know you're spending more time interacting with people on, online than you are in person but also if you know can also be on the other side of the coin too is that you are interacting with people yes. and you may not be interacting with anyone otherwise yes. so um and you know i know for me that there are people that i i interact with and talk to that i may have never met in person you mm-hmm. know i would consider them to be people that i feel that i know very well and i'm yes. sure that they they you know, to a degree, I think they know me quite well and, and probably do. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, I think that that's just a, it's a great way of seeing the world too yes. in all the different ways. Yes. The, but, but the thing is that I always go, I'm, I'm a very positive yeah. person regarding those tools. Sure. And, and the reason I look at those other angles is because I want to make it pers- purposeful that I only build machines to make us get out faster mm-hmm. from the trouble we're in. Sure. You know? Yeah. Uh, religion, I've tried that to behavior modification, but I believe behavior follows incentives. Right. You know, so when you're incentivized to behave a certain way, you do behave a certain way. You don't have to self-police in that sense because sure. you're really following incentives. Sure. And, and I do believe that those tools are incredible are a faster way to correct the limit of my thinking available for everyone. So give me an example of what a tool would be that would that you think would, would reverse some of the negative effects. So I'll start with things I've used myself. Mm-hmm. Okay. So when you're designing when you're designing an algorithm, which is a set of rules to make investment decision in the market. What you're trying to avoid is literally fear and greed. Yeah. You can say it very simple like that. When everybody is afraid, most likely I'll be afraid as well mm-hmm. because I'll, I'll be listening to the same news everybody is listening to. I'll be seeing the same signal everybody is seeing. That's why it's a collective fear. And greed is when I think every, everything is going up because I'm reading the same signals as everyone else. 
When you get to those extremes, I'm making it simple to, 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 you, to see a very simple case of using a machine. The machine tells me at that level of greed, of being positive that you're thinking, you're probably in an illusion space in your head. And do not rely on everybody else thinking the same because the fact do not support that behavior. Right. So even though all my chemical instinct inside of me, which is by being a human being, I follow everyone else because I want to be part of what they're doing, is telling me, keep being greedy. The machine is telling me, you're just following your impulses. The data doesn't confirm this. Be careful. Mm -hmm. Same thing happens on a crisis. On a crisis, everybody thinks, oh, this is going to be destroyed. The world is worse. And the machine is telling you, watch out. You're just self-feeding yourself into all the signal you're right. doing. So I'm thinking a very simple thing right. on how you build trading strategies, for example. Yeah. And you can be pretty complex about this thing. You can think of nanoseconds or you can think of a day or one year. It doesn't matter. But the concept is the same. Where is it that my mammal brain will kick in, my reptilian brain kicks in and all my logic go out? At that moment, I need a friend to call me. That mm -hmm. friend can be a machine or not. Right. I need a friend to tell me, look, we've been there before. You made the same mistake again. Watch out. Right. Now, on the other flip of the coin, what am I doing? Because if the machine is telling me don't do that, that means it's telling the other guy do it. Mm. Okay. That's the flip. Yeah. Because the reason I'm using the machine to protect me, I can also use it to take advantage of someone who doesn't have a machine to protect that person. Right. And that's where it becomes, you know, murky. What are we building? Right. What is the world we want to build? And what role do we want to give those machines? Is it to help us be... Sure. But I, but I think you got the point of... of yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, and, I, and I'm fairly positive about it because I do, you know, I look at a lot of um, you know, Silicon Valley and a lot of where the tech is coming from. And I think, you know, younger generations especially are, are fairly aware of of um, all of those things that we, that, you know, that we've talked about. And... It, you know, and I, I want to say that the majority of people's intentions are, are quite good. And, you know, I think people like Steve Jobs and and other revolutionaries, you know, they may not be perfect and, and some of it may be manipulated, but I really saw, you know, the vision that they had yes. in changing the world. And yes. It wasn't to change the world in a bad way. No. You know, no, and no, that's no. not to say it's all going to be perfect, but I think a lot of what's coming out in the tech world that we're seeing isn't, isn't, of course, it's intended to make money, but it's also not intended, you know, to, to kill us or to harm us. In, no. In a way, it's, to, it's, it's a mutual transaction of making our life easier while prospering some kind of business and, um, you know, and capitalism. And, you know, and that's the, the free market enterprise and that's the world that, that we live in that I, I think is amazing. And, I compare it to a lot of the other places I've worked in the world where they don't have those kind of freedoms to even yes. make those decisions. Yes. You know, they don't even have the decision to, to choose what app that they can message on. No, in those places, yeah. they, in those places that you, you already have just one dictator that's manipulating everything. That's everything, it. Everything, yeah. That's it. It's you just one message. You have the freedom of choice to make the wrong decision. It's, it's just one message. Yeah. You're, you're forced into that wrong yeah. decision through the system. And then on the other side, you know, when they can get through the system, you know, we are on the other side of it exposed to so much stuff that we would never have been exposed to before. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's pretty awesome. Yeah, yeah. I'm, 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 I'm a real positive of, of. But we do need to be aware of the dangers. Yeah, but, but the dangers and, and, and the benefits, because yeah. you know what I mean. What I'm, what I'm trying to really see in my work and in the way. I design and, and why I'm, I'm doing what I'm doing is we can actually solve solve what we haven't been able to solve in all human lifetime yeah. just by understanding that I can build a machine to help me be a better human. Yep. To that friend calling me, you should take that next drink, but not the machine selling me that next drink. 
Yeah. You understand? It's like the machine that tells you now leave the bar because you're most likely going to get in the fight. Yeah. Not that <laughs> machine that say, let me sell you some glow and some box training later sure. so you can kick someone's ass. You know what right. I mean? And that's what I'm saying. We can be conscious of it because all of a sudden for the first time, we are tool makers we can build tools that make us better tool makers. Yeah. And that can be an incredible loop yeah. out of the limitation we see around us today. It is. You know, and you know one, one small example of it, I think, is, is something like, you know, the ride sharing, the Uber of the world, Ubers mm-hmm. of the world, and there's yes. obviously a lot more of them. How many people is that safe from drunk driving? I yes. really believe. Mm-hmm. And then how many people is that given jobs to? Yes. You know, it's not a perfect company by any means. And, you know, there are obviously been a lot of problems with, you know, people have it, but overall, I mean, I think it's such an amazing uh, step in the world, and it's that step that we, we never got from cabs or we didn't get from, you know, it's just made life A, a lot easier, yes. B, saving lives. I really believe that that app has saved lives. We'll never know how many, but it has. Yes. And all the people that have been able to work that they might have lost their jobs and have needed something immediately, or were students or immigrants or whatever it is. And yes. I just think. There's so many. We all benefit from that. We all, you know, we every side of that coin is is getting something out of that. Of course, a taxi a taxi driver who bought a medallion wouldn't yeah, agree with know, that. Yeah, that's, that's, that's another that's another, another aspect as well. But issue. but you know what? The taxi should have evolved with the Ubers. Yeah. You know, and I think that they 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 could have gotten on that bandwagon a lot faster. And I know they have apps and things out, but I, yeah. I can't say I use them. But you know, that's that that's part of that generation's fault for not embracing. Mm-hmm something like an Uber when it came out and being a competitor to that. Instead, they tried to ban it and tried to hide it and tried to do all the things instead of just becoming competitor to it. You know, sort of, that's always the easy way out is to ban something and, and you'll, you'll never stop it. Once something like that is out of the bag, it will find a way. You know, one of the things, talking to what's enjoyable, one of the things I enjoy about riding Uber. And the people you meet, the drivers you meet. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because... Because I know because of the way the app design incentive yeah. of building reputation based on yeah. how many points. So that person has an incentive to be a kinder person yeah. while um, I am on the right. Why is that a bad thing? That's actually a very good thing. Yeah. You understand? Because through using those machines that is optimizing me having a great ride, that human being driving, he's kinder yeah. because he's yeah. using you. And he wants to tip. So it goes <laughs> exactly. back to the old, the old um, adage of, you know, you tip for service. And yes. I think sometimes people just expect that you tip. But yes. no, you tip for service. Exactly. And, you know, they get their inbuilt tip. But then there's that incentive at the end to, you know, if you want to give a compliment on there extra you tip. Go. And, you know, they all want they that. They all want they that. They all want that. So, and it's quite lovely because, it I, you know, lovely. they're lovely. They have water in the car. They're lovely. You know, they're very kind to you because they want that. And that's a good incentive. Exactly. It's good for you, good for them. And, you know, it, it creates a, a calm society. That. Whereas, honestly... I can I can tell you more bad experiences in a cab than good ones. But because because it's it's pretty simple. Look, again we go. Incentives drives behavior. Yes. There's nothing bad about it, it's just the way the brain works. Yeah. Okay, so when I take a taxi, what is the probability that I take the same taxi again within the next year? Very low. Yeah. Okay? But when I take an Uber and I grade this guy, yeah. the next client is not Holly or William. The next client is, again, Uber client. Yeah. It is, so from the point of view of the driver, yeah. he only has one client always getting on that car, yeah. which is Uber client yes. that will grade his reputation based on as if all of us were talking to each other to say, what do we think about this guy? Yeah. When you're a taxi driver, you're not exposed to that because each person in the car is the first and only transaction you'll ever do. Yeah, and they're, they're really, it, you know, and that was to me, I, you know, I, you just constantly, it was the whole myth of the, not myth, the whole reality of the New York cab driver was an asshole. And yeah. that's the truth. <laughs> you know, always was the truth. Yeah, but you know what the funny thing is? I can take the I same, piss me off. the same cab driver yeah. on a taxi and I put him on an Uber, and he has to become kinder. Yeah, Why? Does. Because of the design of what the algorithm is maximizing. Yeah. You know, and that's what we were talking about, using those things to actually make it more enjoyable interacting with another human being. An algorithm yeah. actually makes my day better yeah. because I'm using it. Yeah. 
You know, it incentivizes everybody to behave well because you'll be graded after. Yeah. And that's, it's not that, that hard to behave. Is that, you know, because incentive, incentive drives behavior. That's what it is. Yeah. <laughs> that's what it is. As simple. You take the same human being, you put him in a different environment, he will behave differently. Yeah. That's what it is. You know, and, 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 and we need to be aware of those things. Yeah. When we design, we need to be aware of what's going on. And we need to know that there is a positive and a negative side to it. And design has to be done purposefully yeah. to get out of the trouble we're in. Yeah. And I'm a, I'm a, I'm a big believer. It's, I don't even need to believe it's a fact. That's, that's yeah. what I've used all my, all my logical life, you know, yeah. because I've seen so much bad decision made around me, create so much destruction, even yeah. me personally and other people. That's why very early I start to understand how to use um, something that helped me become smarter, you know, by telling me, hey, at those moments, that's when you're most vulnerable, you know? Yeah. And that's what, and that's what it is. You know, that's why you, you call a group of friends. Now you're, you can call it a group of other machines helping your brain become more aware of its flaws. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Let's finish up on what yeah. app you can't live without that benefits your life. Oh, Uber. Okay. <laughs> right. See, it's great, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, what about you? I mean, I think I can live without any of them, but yeah. I love Shazam. <laughs> I do. I love Shazam. You know how many times you're listening to a movie or you're in a store and you hear that song, you're like, what the fuck is that song? I think it's an interesting time and I, I'm interested to see what how this conversation changes in a year or two.